Hello there, I'm the student and this is another video on my channel and today I wanted to talk about the elective monarchy government reform. And just to make it clear in the beginning of the video, this has nothing, literally nothing to do with the Polish elective monarchy, which is uh, called the same, as you can see, Polish elective monarchy. It has nothing to do with that. And as it has nothing to do with that, and it is a completely unique new type of the government, I think this is actually worth mentioning, especially because I think this is by far the best generic monarchy government reform that you can get on this tier one, way better than autocracy or feudal nobility for that matter, and in my opinion even better than some unique modifiers, such as the Brandenburgian for example. And also I think I have to mention that you shouldn't be afraid of those modifiers that it gives over here, because those are only negative modifiers obviously, but the government mechanic of this government reform, that is the really strong one, which is this event over here, when a ruler comes of age in this case, or when a ruler dies which gives you plenty of opportunities to choose your next ruler. So let's just get right into the video and right into the three reasons why I think that this government reform is the most underrated government reform in the game, in my opinion. So the first reason for that is actually not a very interesting one, because you have to keep in mind that this government reform over here is basically a normal monarchy if you want it to be a mon normal monarchy. So if you have a 666 ruler, which I don't have in this case, but if you had, then you could just choose that ruler and everything will be fine. You would get five legitimacy, it's just like a normal monarchy and you would get a normal heir, you can get the normal events for heirs, you can become uh, the emperor of the HRE if you want, you can switch to another dynasty like you can with any other monarchy as well. The only other difference is that you get those five other choices over here on top of the normal monarchy way. And as it's not like the Polish monarchy where other people choose what your heir is, this is all your choice. You can choose whatever you want in this event. You can choose your heir completely by yourself. And uh, that is the first reason why I think that it is way stronger than most people think, because it is a normal monarchy if you want it to be, but it can be way more. And obviously it is not a fixed government reform, which means that you can switch out of that to other reforms whenever you want, for example if you are in the age of absolutism. So I was talking about that it can be way more and way better than a normal monarchy if you want it to be. And that has to do with uh, two major reasons, which are reason two and three for me, why this is an incredibly underrated uh, government reform. And the first one has to do with the second choice. We talked about the first one already, which uh, keeps your monarch if you just uh, want to keep him. But now let's talk a little bit over the second option that you can choose, which is a Foragen Noble. As you can see in this case it's a Rurikovic, but I'm going to talk about that in detail on two other examples. So first of all, to get that decision, the requirements that you need to have is that you have any neighboring country that is not in a regency that has the nobility estates and therefore not a parliamentarism uh, reform, that is Christian if you are also Christian, and that is independent or a tributary. And if there are multiple nations that match that conditions, so multiple of those nations are bordering you, then the biggest country is chosen by that, and the biggest country means great power score in this uh, situation. And uh, this means that it in would include uh, subjects, although the neighboring province has to be directly owned by the nation that this event uh, fires for. Uh, in this case you can see I've got uh, this one province over here uh, in Ingerman's land, 
that is bordering Muscovy, which means that uh, Muscovy is the biggest nation that I am bordering right now that has the nobility estate. You notice that I am also bordering Austria over here, as you can see with this province. So theoretically Austria is the biggest nation, but Austria choose uh, parliamentarism, uh, which means that they don't have a nobility estate. And as this gives you a Forgian noble, it gives you a Forgian noble of the country that was chosen by the requirements, I said, which is of their dynasty, of their religion and of their culture. This ruler is randomized, so it has randomized stats, but in this option, the randomized stats are actually way worse than the normal random stats are because the stats of those monarchs that you choose from this option will have minus two on every skill. I think this is actually necessary to balance this out because this obviously lets you PUing those nations that you get a foreign ruler of. So in this case, I would be able to PU Muscovy if they wouldn't have an heir. I'm not in this Scotland game just for fun, just to uh, show it to you. I could do that in a console command game as well. I'm in this game because I tested the elective monarchy in this campaign and I've also obviously tested the ability to PUing nations with that uh, government type. And for that I've got two examples in this campaign, which is first Castile. Which I noticed that they didn't have an heir in 1497. And my ruler was able to abdicate, as you could see, and I was able to choose the elective monarchy. Which means that the only thing that I was missing was a land connection or a neighboring province to Castile, uh, where I can then abdicate my ruler, choose the Castilian dynasty, claim their throne and go into PU them. And that's exactly what I did via uh, fighting Tunis, uh, as you can see right now. I fought Tunis via no CB war, which I think two stability is way worth it uh, to get Castile as a personal union. And also they had no allies, so it was a really easy war and I took a province that was bordering Castile. As you can see over there, I have this little province, which is also yellow, uh, down in uh, Portugal, which means that I can now choose the elective monarchy, which I did, and abdicate my ruler now. Now this gives me, as you can see, the choice to choose a De Trastamara dynasty, which I obviously am going to do, but let's just have a look on the other uh, pr uh, options that uh, I get, because they're going to be relevant in uh, the next part of the video. <coughs> so quite nice uh, stats over there, but obviously I'm going to choose the De Trasamara uh, dynasty, and now I'm going to royal marriage them, as you can see, they would accept that, and claim their throne. And after that, it is totally easy to go in and fight them for their throne.
And there we go, I've uh, won against Castile and now I can take the Union with, Ca with Castile, also some money for a longer truce. And uh, no coalition as you can see, because uh, yeah, Castile is not that much coalition as it is uh, pretty far away from the German uh, nations. So that was that and now I have a Castile personal union and let's get to the second example of Denmark. With Denmark, I noticed that they were in a regency, which means that uh, if the heir comes of age, uh, they are most likely not going to have an heir, which means uh, that I had a little bit more time to prepare a border, which I uh, did, as you can see, with that one province that I took from uh, Sweden. And uh, at that point, I was just waiting until the regency of Denmark ends, and after that, I just simply abdicated my ruler again, same as I did with uh, Castile. Uh, and this time I have the option to get a von Oldenburg uh, as, my, uh, as my ruler. And this one is obviously the same dynasty as uh, Denmark, as it is uh, the biggest bordering nation that I have. Uh, that is not in a regency, as you can see, and has no heir. So I choose him and I can royal marriage him after I... Uh, so let's just see the other uh, choices. Uh, actually the one from the generalship is a pretty nice one. But obviously we're going to choose the no Oldenburg thing right now. And now I'm going to improve relations with Denmark so that I can royal marry him. And uh, this is going to take just uh, like 3-4 uh, months and it is extremely unlikely that they get a, uh, an heir in this uh, short amount of time. So there we go and now after I claim the throne there is no way that I'm going to lose that personal union be because even if they break it, I rivaled them as, as you can see, I will still keep the CB on them. And the war was pretty annoying, but uh, together with France, I could actually achieve a victory over here. And as you can see, there is no coalition, which is because I improved relations with mo most of the German nations. And that is now where I have uh, Castile and Denmark as a personal union as Scotland in 1532. Now, as you saw in the examples, uh, I had two major personal unions within 40 years via this second option of the event from the elective monarchy. And if you compare that to other personal union games, you, keep it, you have to keep in mind that I'm playing as Scotland. I get none of those PUs via a mission tree or something. Both PUs that I've got were 100% scripted by me, by myself, and there was actually a minimum amount of luck involved in those PUs, as I chose the time that I abdicated my ruler perfectly on the time where those nations didn't have an heir. And this is basically what you can do uh, in your games a lot more often. And actually I would be able to do it the same thing with Austria right now. As they don't have an heir and I have a royal marriage with them. They haven't rivaled me because I forced them to give up their rivalry on me. But uh, as I already said, they have chosen parliamentarism, which means that they don't have the nobility estate which means that they don't count for this option, so uh, quite unlucky over there. But uh, I guess those two examples were enough to show that this second option alone would be worth the 10% uh, all estate influence modifier that this gives. Now let's get to the third reason why in my opinion this is the best generic monarchy government reform that you can get in the game currently. The reason are 
all the other four choices that you can have over here. Let's start with this one, crown one from our nobility. This option is actually available if you have a nobility, if you are not in a regency and if you don't have an heir. And as you can see, it gives you a randomized ruler. Actually, in this case, I was extremely lucky with him because this average ruler has a minus one on every stat. Uh, so not as bad as the second option, but uh, still it is uh, on average a bad ruler. But in this case it's actually a pretty nice one, uh, I have to admit. And on top of that it gives also 20 loyalty for the nobility. And by the way, all of the other options over here give you a ruler of your dynasty, your religion and your culture. So let's get to the next one. Our general would make a fine ruler. This is actually not making a general ruler. It gives you a random ruler, but it is army related. That's why it is called a general. This option is available if you have 30 or more regiments, so 30,000 troops or more, which is, in my opinion, actually not difficult to reach at all in this game. And now the next three options are pretty interesting because they give you a randomized ruler but the stats are somewhat focused on the ability of the ruler. Which means in this case, as, uh, as it is one from the army, the stats of the ruler, the random stats of the ruler are modified by minus one for admin, minus one for diplo and plus two for mill which means that he has an average of 5 in mil. In this case, as you can see, there is uh, just a 4, so it is uh, quite below average. But still, on average, it would be 3-3-3 three, three, three as any other ruler as well, but it is focused on military points, which you can choose if you want military points. And on top of that, it gives 10 army tradition. The next one is the same for an admiral. It, it doesn't take an actual admiral in your fleet. It takes a random ruler. But in this case, the stats are modified with minus one on admin, plus two on diplo, and minus one on mill. So a diplo focused randomized ruler, but still on average nine monarch skill. As you can see in this case, it is even a six in diplo, sadly a zero in admin so uh, wouldn't be a really nice option over here and on top of that it gives 10 navy tradition and those two options over here make your new ruler a general or an admiral whether one you choose it which uh, from my testing have a round average of eight pips and the last one is an influential trader, as uh, it says. And this trader is also randomized, but in this case with an admin focus, which means it has on average plus two on admin, minus one on diplo, minus one on mill. And on top of that, you get 10% of your yearly income. And you can take this influential trader over here. So this option is unlocked if you have the uh, bourgeoisie or the burgers estate and if they have over 80% influence. The choice is what makes those four options in combination extremely strong. Because if you haven't noticed yet, uh, this one over here, you can't see his stats. But all th four of those, there you can see the stats. Which means that you can see what stat your ruler could have, theoretically. Instead of just a random rolling uh, one king that could be extremely bad or extremely strong, in this event you are rolling up to four random rulers. Which means that you can choose between four random stat rows that are even focused on these uh, three ones and you can simply choose the best one of them, which would be in this case probably the nobility one. So this event just gives you a huge choice on what ruler should rule your country and how his stats should look like. Obviously you can do only one thing at a time. You could only either choose the Forger Noble to uh, get personal unions, which uh, will be probably a pretty bad ruler on the stats, 
or you could choose the best stat ruler just for uh, the monarch point generation if you don't go for PUs at all, which makes this uh, government reform even uh, valuable for non-Christian nations. And there are two other information that I want to give you and uh, number one is this little government reform over here on tier two, which is called Nobis Electorate, which is probably one of the most useless government reforms in the game. But if you have the elective monarchy government type over here and if you go for aristocratic ideas, which enables this government reform, then this makes it actually one of the best uh, tier 2 government reforms because it gives you, you can see it down uh, on the government mechanics, it gives you increase the skill of candidates of the rule election. Which means that the skills of the randomized rulers that I was showing you uh, just a second ago, they will be increased by one point in each category, which uh, makes them even stronger and uh, even above average, which means that if you have a choice of four different rulers that are all above average, I can almost guarantee you that there is one ruler in, a, in that that will be a really nice and valuable monarch uh, when it comes to the monarch skill. And the other thing has to do with this uh, tennis tree unique uh, Irish government reform, which you can also get if you are just uh, Irish primary culture. And same goes also for the high Irish kingdom government reform, which you get if you are Ireland and Irish culture. Uh, because this one has an additional option, as you can see, it says that over there it can select a ruler from, a ru from the ruling dynasty. Which means that over here, as you can see, I don't have enough troops for the other op uh, for the other options. But I can choose my current monarch. I can choose a Lancaster because uh, England is uh, bordering me right now, and I can choose one from my nobility. And I can get another option, which makes it a maximum of seven different options in this event, if you fulfill all the requirements. That gives you somebody from the Yaw dynasty, which is uh, completely random, just an average 3-3-3 uh, three, 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 uh, on average. But it is also open, so you can see the monarch stats, which gives you another option to choose from and another chance of getting a good ruler via this event. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video. I think this is actually a really underrated uh, government reform and I think it is by far the best generic government reform for tier 1 for monarchies. But uh, what do you think? Write it down in the comments and we are going to see in the next video.